Welcome to the APA Standards and Codes webinar series. My name is Billy Zadig, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and presentation slides will be posted on our webpage in a few days. All attendees are in listen mode in listen only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by the presenter. Continuing education credits are being offered for this webinar. Please contact me at jelly, B-I-L-L-I-E, at appa.org for more information. Also, if you have more than one person attending this session from a central location, please contact me so everyone gets credit for attending. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Chris. It's all yours, Chris. Uh, thank you, Billy. Uh, my name is Chris Zimmerman, and I'm employed at the University of Houston downtown, right in the middle of Houston. And I've been here in Houston about 60 years so since I could first remember um, the first hurricane um, it's it's been quite a few years and so the nature of this piece is to show you a little bit about Hurricane Harvey that catastrophic climate event that not too many people will forget and so it was at the University of Houston downtown it's our experience and this is some prior history I have uh, working with some storms in different capacities, different occupations. But it essentially started back there in 1983 with Alicia. And then working through Tropical Storm Allison, which that was fun. And then September 2005 for Hurricane Rita. We all remember the uh, evacuation process on that. Um, September 2008, Hurricane Ike. And of course, Hurricane Harvey is our concentration today. And if we look at that picture up there, if you can see right, right around this fence, that fence line is debris. And so that kind of gives you an idea in that picture what was underwater. Uh, all of that street, that road, those bushes, shrubs. Um, and I think we have a link here that's got a picture. We can get to that. And so that was Harvey sitting on us uh, forever, it seemed like. But that's the nature of what the storm looked like. And that was the beginning point. If you look down here at this corner, it's August 26th. So it, it moved around us for a while. So, you know, the nature of a storm, and I'm going to try to just keep this really fundamental, is that you know, once you know the storm is heading your direction, you want to pre prepare for the worst flood catastrophe. That's probably what's going to happen if you're on the coast. And, and I'm, I'm sure we're talking to a, a large array of people, you know, good morning, good afternoon. And so to begin that catastrophic risk assessment, that's the first ideal there. If we look over in our picture, this sign here that's on the wall where that water line, that's about six feet. So if we look across the roadway, those overpasses, that flood went all the way to the other side of that green. Those cars you see there would be underwater. And so the nature of that piece is, you know, we really want to get, begin the catastrophic assessment as soon as possible. We want to model. So if we look at A, it's, let's accept the risk for what it is uh, through risk identification. We'll measure and map the risk. We'll begin continuous preparation procedures. And B, we'll consider the highest vulnerability and susceptibility to damage in the property portfolio. Um, kind of like an earthquake, you know, the epicenter 
the notion of the epicenter is where is the worst damage going to be? Really large universities, um, they may be spread over a hundred miles. We're just spread over about a mile and a half. So pretty much everything is, uh, is once it floods, it, it's all flooded. And so we'll reduce the risk through containment. We'll avoid the risk through, through uh, removal transfer. And just another link to them. Uh, there's some pretty good resources relative to risk assessment. There's a lot of data on catastrophic events. And so it's always good to just move through some of these links and pick up some of that information. You know, even now we're here we are in March and we're thinking about this right now because in front of us in March is hurricane season. So we're always going to links and trying to find more information, historical data. And so accepting the risk is essentially, we measure and map the risk. We've got to determine where the modeling is going to be at. And we're going to see that uh, come up through local access sites. We got to stay focused on one or two sources of information. That way we don't create confusion overall with the information. So we'll look to source a national source and a local source for compar comparisons of intensity and location impact. The nature of it is, is there's some really good modeling that goes on nowadays, which we didn't have way back when. So we can model, we can watch models of storms and determine just you know, where is it going to impact? And so if we look over at this picture at this water line, we can see that that's actually our mail room. That's, that's about three feet, you know, a little less than three feet water line for the mail room. Um, pretty much everything on the first floor was in our campus kind of slope. So at one end it was at six foot, you know, at the other end, it was like three foot or two foot. So the, the nature of, that model source, it lets us understand that historical data of where that, where that water line is really promotes looking early into the season because we know what's coming. And the next piece of that is to implement a review of emergency management protocols because we know what's coming. And so we'll book, bookmark those local and county sites for emergency evacuation routes and look at some historical data. We've got a tremendous amount of data um, relative to coastal regions all over the nation. And we're gonna keep our information up to date with those local and county resources. Um, review prior historic catastrophic outcomes. Believe it or not, you can go out and find all kinds of historical information about evacuation routes, um, bayou depth levels, counties that flooded prior to, review that data, think about what it is that you need to review in prior storms, because that's, that's beneficial information for you when you're coming up to a new season. Um, and here's another link that provides some really good information just about catastrophic events, hurricanes, um, all kinds of really good information to use, to gather, a lot of different links uh, associated. If we look at associated content, preparedness, information sheets, the Hurricane Center, just a tremendous amount of information that. It's really useful, extremely useful. And so accepting the risk through risk identification is too is to begin a continuous preparation procedures to mitigate that risk. Yeah, you know, we've accepted it now. We know it's coming. We don't know what's coming, but we need to review because because of our prior history, we've had enough storms that did so much damage here. And so we think about the preparation, you know, 
the protocol, the emergency management protocol, and quite possibly what is it we need to review as we're modeling through and we're coming up to the season. We need to go back through some of our really close 120 hour tables and say, yeah, what is it we 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 need to review here? So, and if you look, I'm giving you an example of 120 hours before the storm. Once you've determined through modeling that you're going to have an impact, there's quite a lot of work to be done, and it's 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 quite a lot of work from beginning to end. But to start the process, you could see in these columns. Um, Everything that's on the top of roofs that's around the sides of the building that will float needs to be moved or removed. I haven't I haven't yet seen a container, a 30, 40 yard dumpster float yet. So um, that'll be new to me. But getting those dumpsters on site prior to a storm, that's critical. Uh, those are some critical pieces. Getting personnel, your right out team uh, fixed so we know who's going to be that group to ride out the storm. I want to say I've been into five ride out teams. And so those are very interesting. Um, in the size of buildings, the elevation of buildings. I've, I've been in ride out teams where we were a thousand feet in the air and we were trying to assess damage and start that data process. So once again, you can see, you know, this Coke machine gives me a reminder of, of all the things that we rented on property that were submerged. And so I'm thinking of all those agreements we had um, with rental devices, one of the reasons I put that picture there, because that sooner or later that's going to come up. And so let's consider the highest vulnerability and susceptibility to damage to the property portfolio. That's the epicenter I was talking about. Um, yeah, this picture is a great example of what will float and where it ends up after it's been floating. And so what we'd like to do is re re reduce that content, reduce that risk. Um, and so we're going to determine immediately the risk limitations and we're going to try to lower that exposure. So what we've got to ask ourselves is, you know, what can be elevated to a higher level on the property? And as we're getting closer through, through modeling, uh, through the local sites and, and national websites is where can I move a lot of the material above the exposure for? How can I elevate it? That's what I'm thinking, first of all. Because if I don't elevate it, it's eventually going to be everywhere. And so the next piece of that is to search for opportunities to reduce the impact in the cleanup. And so I got to think about what, what can be stowed away inside the building and elevated. What is it that I have to move? And that takes a lot of time to move things that are going to be moved around in water. Uh, you may have a few things that are going to stay stable in water. They'll just be out of commission because they've been flooded. But um, uh, anything that you can move off the floor when you have, when your modeling shows you're going to have an impact, as much as you can move off of the floor of impact, that level is, is critical because it'll all be a part of your cleanup. Yeah, of course, we're going to review roof perimeter, exterior doors, and stairwell accesses. The entire fenestration of the building is going to be looked at. I mean, all the sides, uh, the entire roof. We'll, we'll just go through with binoculars looking wherever we have access to get outside the building. All penetrations, stairwell access doors, all penetrations to the building. We'll have to go through those to make sure they're tight. That's where we reseal. 
use sealing agents and reseal and, and prep those areas um, for sealing to make sure they're closed. Here's another link, um, another good source of information, uh, where you can actually, if we look over here to your right, you can actually uh, see a floodway zone where you can actually type in your address. This has really got some very good information relative to um, flood zones, you know, 100 year, 500 year. Uh, you can even find your own residence zone. You just type in your address and you'll see something like what's over in this corner. Documents, um, you can search by address, search by product. Really, it's really a good source of information relative to launch to that with coordinates for a flood map. And so if we move to the next understanding under vulnerability and susceptibility, you know, the next thing is how can I, how can I avoid the risk? Yeah, you know, I've moved some stuff up. What, what can I do to avoid it? You know, can I transfer it? Are there assets that I can transfer off property um, for really, really large communities, universities, they might be able to transfer assets 50, 60, 100 miles north or west or east. But, you know, if you're an island, that's going to be a problem. Um, but uh, if you're a small university like us, you know, where are we going to put them? Uh, pretty much in Hurricane Harvey, everyone was underwater. So if you didn't move stuff north um, quite a long distance, you you were underwater if you you were at the first four eleven. So avoiding that is I, I want to determine immediate removal of potential at potential assets. What what can be transferred and removed off property? And where am I going to put it? You know. And I'm going to search for opportunities to reduce the impact. What can be stowed away inside the billet elevated? You know, we took it to higher floors. We've gone through that. And so the next concentration is adjustments and consultants and durability. Immediately after the storm, we're going to be dealing with adjusters, consultants. Um, there's going to be a tremendous amount of work relative to negotiations. And if you've prepared in-house teams, um, or, or acquired managing consultants, um, you know, that they're going to do a lot of negotiation for you because your ultimate goal is the recovery dollar. How do we, how do we obtain that recovery dollar? And so we'll talk about in-house teams and consultants that can pay for the claim. And then we meet with the adjusters and walk them, walk with them on the property make all documentation available to adjusters. Keep in mind the first people that are coming on property, those are, they're building the database uh, through pictures. Some of these pictures you've seen during the flood, but they're building that database and it's going to continue to build. So we'll make all that documentation available. And adjusters will be available. They, they meet the demand of the catastrophes. They're going to be available and they're, they travel transition geographically continuously all year long. So you may have see some new faces. Um, this link here is about catastrophic loss. And so there's some really good information relative to the indexes of catastrophic loss. And let's, let's face it. If you're going to negotiate manage claims, you're going to be managing for what's been destroyed to be rebuilt and reclaim that remediation cleanup dollar, that recovery dollar. And it, it pays to have some information. Um, there's a lot of different sites uh, for this information, but it pays to learn about the claims process because uh, the market changes quickly. And so in-house teams and managing consultants. Here we can see this water line. That's where that 
line was at about you know five and a half six feet all of this was underwater and so in-house teams in-house teams may have the expertise or, or they may be limited in knowledge about the organization of the claims process um, there's a lot of people in Houston that have a lot of experience um, with catastrophic flooding and hurricanes simply because of their their prior time in those events you learn you learn more with every event and you learn more about the claims process with every event and so the first people that are going to be on on property who can get to the property um, is essentially probably going to relieve the write out team and there's data there that's that's being stored through pictures during that write out and you, you've got to continue uh, that development of that database and that in the damage assessment because that really critical to them uh, continue to retain that information and build it the more you you can't have too much information um, relative to the catastrophic event you just can't have it um, consider assembly of an in-house team that's dedicated to the management of the claims process usually risk management there's probably a dedicated group of people that will manage the process um, I've been in, in an area where that process went for four and a half years. We managed that process. It actually took four and a half years before we closed the claim down. Um, so that's really important. You have a team that, you know, and, and that's learned a tremendous amount of information. Training's great for that. Tremendous amount of, of information about the claims process and managing those processes. Ultimately, you're trying to recover that that dollar, that remediation, that that rebuild dollar. I could say, you know, the experience this system, the University of Houston system, has is these people are relentless for the remodel dollar, um, for that rebuild dollar. They just never give up, and 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 that's a really good point to recognize it's going to be a long process and you just can't give up for that for that claim dollar and so the next piece is developing a contingency controls and schedules with direct attention to resource requirements for mediation and, and rebuilding scopes that team is probably going to have uh, a lot of requirements they're going to learn about those resource requirements. They're going to understand the remediation process. And, and we all know that we're going to have to rebuild. And so there's going to be rebuilding scopes. And, and that, that can become pretty tricky, rebuilding scopes. So let's look at the next piece about the consultants can paper the claims and manage the contracts construction process you know there are some go no go decisions for operations um, prior to getting these people adjusters claims managers on property you know infrastructure is going to be hard to travel through I, I remember it took me three days I had to try every day for three days to get to our campus I just couldn't make it through the, the amount of water. And so I just go back, try again, um, until I finally got here. And so clearly there was decisions as soon as we get here. And there's some relief for the ride out crew. And they're go decisions. Um, they are things that we can do that we haven't had adjusters or claims managers look at right away. And that's cleanup because we're going to have to start exposing some of the damage that's done. And of course, that's got to be documented before you clean up. You've got to have all of the damage documented. 
And so we went around with cameras and cell phones and oh my, we, we took a lot of information, recorded a lot of information. And you got to remember too, also during that event, whoever makes it to the campus, probably there's a whole lot of people that are, they're stuck. They're out in the environment. So they're not able to be mobile. It's important that, that we get to our campus first and, and continue that documentation. So, and then we can organize contract consultants, adjusters and start organization of that database for them to provide them those pieces. You know, one of the decisions at that point, once we've got our data together, our pictures, our recordings, is we need to start cleaning up with whoever is available on campus to, to begin that process. And we got to recognize also that there's fluctuating market conditions and that's going to affect prices. You know, already stabilized, there's contractors and remediation um, GCs and all kinds of people out there that already have pricing available in the market, but due to supply and demand, those prices are going to fluctuate quickly. And we see that every storm, we see that um, more, more material has to be brought in and prices increase, simple supply and demand. You got to be prepared for that. There's a lot of consultants and there's a lot of GCs. I don't try to tout any one person, but I recommend that you go out and, and read. For us, it's reading, you know, January, clear up into the season, reading about different people, consultants and GCs, how they approach the catastrophic event. You know, what are their ideas? There's a tremendous amount of information that they put out on their websites that you can just exploit. Um, become more knowledgeable about what they do and where they do it. Um, really important. So we're going to meet with adjusters on property, make all documentation available, provide pictures, original prints, PDFs, and floor plates of damaged area, everything that's been built on the property. Um, as it was prior to the catastrophic event, it's really important to have all of that information, um, base CAD, floor plates with up-to-date stacking plans, prior construction. And even if it's done in the house, somebody's done a drawing, you know, somewhere relative to a build out and each floor plate, it's just incredibly important that you have that, that design, that area, that square footage. It's really important because that's what you're going to build back. And so if we look at uh, the adjusters, they'll be available to meet the demands of the catastrophe. Adjuster tools and pricing applications in a geographical area by market condition. There, there, you know, the market changes by geographical area depending on the catastrophe. It's, if you think about it, you know, you go to one corner of the nation or one corner of the planet for catastrophe, those expenses, materials, it's a global market. The entire market's affected. And so the nice thing about adjusters and the nice things about claim managers and contractors is they have some tools and applications uh, to where they can engage each other about expenses. We would like to, be, you know, that's relative to the claim settlement process. We would like to say that 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 interest, that industry has found ways, available resources to assist us in a, in a fair and equitable settlement. You know, and that's both parties. It's both parties, meaning consultants in the insurance industry and what's being built. And it's really important that we have updated material of what was devastated prior to that catastrophic event to provide um, those that industry. Very important that we have that noted. remediation and then renovation. 
so beginning the catastrophic remediation and renovation, you know, debris, debris remediation and removal first remediation consists of clearance removal of the debris that hinders or poses an immediate threat to public health and safety. Um, there's a lot of the flooding that you see, there was all kinds of mixed water, um, storm, all kinds of different systems mixed in a flood. And so the nature of that piece needs to be examined in we need to categorize debris, separate debris, if at all possible. B, renovation and recovery, define the priority to open access to critical communities and operations on campus. What are we going to open first? And, you know, that might relate to a community need. Uh, so we need to consider that because the community is definitely going to be a need. <laughs> And so NC would be rebuild design implementations and, and execution errors. Design errors and execution errors, we're going to talk about that. If we look at our picture there, the reason why I put that one, it doesn't look like it's really that deep, but um, that's, that's a parking garage. And in parking garage and slabs, one of the things I noticed right in the center of this was all the electrical that was under the slab. And so all of that was flooded. And so that poses a, poses a problem for us. Um, one of the reasons I noted this picture is all of that electrical that's underneath the cement, that, that poses a considerable problem. And so let's look at debris remediation and removal. Remediation consists of the clearance removal of debris that hinders and poses an immediate threat to public health and safety. Preliminary planning with remediation contractors to remove hazardous material that poses a health risk for occupancy. Those people that are coming on site, first responders coming on site, a lot of that debris can be hazardous. So ultimately that's what we would want to remove first we would want to remove the debris that's hazardous debris and so that's probably going to take a contractor for us you know ehs was on site for us risk management was on site we were all all eyeballs were everybody's eyeballs were paying attention to what was being removed and bagged because it's really important to understand the nature of hazardous debris and so once we remove the hazardous part of the debris, you know, if we can for non-hazardous waste, if we can categorize it, such as separating metals, the, that's a recycled product. So metals, if we can, we, if we can recycle and, and separate debris, it's it's good to do that. Chips and board, we can. Re if we can separate it. So let's look at renovation and recovery and define the priority of open access to critical community facilities operations. So as facilities management, we were really very concentrated. You know, here we are in August, it's hot. We're moving into September. We finally got back on campus and it's still hot and we needed some cooling. So our concentration was going to be, let's get the plants online. Let's get cooling online. And what we recognized was one of the buildings that's associated fed from the plant was an area that the community of students could use. And they could use it for showers, heating, cooling. Um, we recognized that actually getting the plan online, we could, we could move over to a building that was really much easier to clean out and have prepared so that students in the community of students could use that building. And uh, that turned out to be very, um, uh, 
that, that turned out to be very helpful for the community. Our, our leadership said, let's put this together and get this building open. And we opened a gym. And uh, you'd be surprised how many people showed up in collaboration with us getting our plan online and open that gym. Um, they showed up for food. They showed up with their children. They showed up for showers. Um, it's wonderful to consider that piece together with, you know, it's right in line with what we're doing. And, and we could actually make that accessible. Uh, we won't forget that. That was first critical. So that care and concern genuinely expressed for the community through services that you're gonna do anyway, um, with critical facility services, uh, you, it's a good idea to think about that. Uh, and that takes the building buildings and the facility, you know, as you're cleaning, remediating, getting rid of debris, you know, we, we need to, you know, the contractors are, are helping us to, to bring the facility to a recognizable state, you know, which is, we want to say that exactly what was there before. And so, you know, because we're going to rebuild what was there before. So that's a really important piece. Um, there's another link that's really good. That was the, that picture is, yeah. you know, this is about risk modeling. And so we, we do a lot of risk modeling um, just prior to investigation of this modeling, just prior to a season. I, I guess everybody has their, their own seasons, uh, the North for, you know, winter, and, the South for hurricanes, possibly the West. Um, everybody has a season that they're probably going to concentrate in. This had some really good information relative to probability and, and modeling. And so we're going to move to the rebuild design implementation, the ex execution errors. Um, you know, design errors and execution errors. A recognizable construction make ready state is the original building design floor plan or plans, floor plates that you had before the storm. And so, yeah, I guess I want to make that a level of importance. It's, you absolutely got to have really good prior, prior drawings, prior floor plates. Older historic buildings um, may not have been built to the current code. You, they're, they're codes that may go back, depending on how old the building is, could go back 60 years, 50 years, 80 years. Um, so, you know, that's a major renovation in a catastrophic event. And probably what's going to happen is that building is going to have to be brought up to code for those particular areas um, that are in the renovation. If it's a major renovation, the building, it, it could possibly be the whole building. And so, the, once again, the prior stacking plans and floor plans are extremely helpful there, designs. Any modifications to prior designs, that needs to be approved first. And so that's part of the claims manager, adjusters, communication. Those teams are constantly negotiating um, that rebuilding process, the code process, the recovery dollar. That's, that's essentially where it goes to trying to retain, uh, acquire, retain that, that recovery dollar. And so recovery people and expenses. Recovery people, people are your most valuable assets to manage your recovery. Uh, you got to recognize the hardship of, of infrastructure and disruptive. You know, everything's been disrupted. And we want to complete the work to adjuster's perspective, you know, safely. And so they'll guide us as to working through that rebuild, that recovery. And so they're unsure the work continues to the perspective of adjusters and claims managers, and we want to do it safely. And then, you know, if we can exploit prior experiences and proficient processes, by all means, you know, community resilience to remedy a problem saves money in the long term. 
what we learn over historical events helps us to become more efficient. And so I, I can't note enough that uh, getting people back to the property, they're your most valuable asset to manage recovery. And so everybody's been through this complete catastrophic, you know, disruption. And you're going to try to assemble a team to come back to the property and get there as soon as possible. And, and so you've got to communicate with that team and assembling the teams daily to keep track of who is on sites. It's critical because you don't know who's going to show up. And there's a lot of people down here that, you know, they didn't have houses. They were six feet under. They were, we couldn't even communicate with them for sometimes a week, you know, figure out where they were at. So, you know, that's a really important piece to, to communicate with people and track people and muster people on a daily basis. There's going to be human resources. They won't be able to return to work right away. It's just not going to happen, but you know, keep it in contact with them to know they're, they're out there, they're alive. Yeah, that's important. And the people that do show up, we want to show, we want to choose key individuals relative to the work area of their specific confidence uh, in recovery to recover. We want to put those in, put those people in their specific area of, of confidence, uh, not moving too many people around and a whole lot of different areas in the house staff is, is what I'm what I'm re referring to. It's always it's always better to keep people that are knowledgeable about this particular area: electricians and electrical, HVAC and HVAC, plumbing and plumbing. And there will be human resources over time. Your staff over time, depending on how you work the process. Of I've worked remediation processes in a twelve to twelve fashion. In an eight, you know, continuous eight hour shift fashion, it just depends on the staffing that you have um, to work those pieces. It normally doesn't last longer than probably a month for cleanup, but there is so much work to do in a catastrophic event um, that there is a lot of hours worked up front and people will talk. You got to watch your people very closely, supervisors and managers, keep an eyeball on them. Uh, I know EHS, all of the managers here, directors, supervisors, we're watching staff continuously moving about. They've got their own stresses outside of the working environment too. They gotta go back to on a daily basis. So we'll tire out and burn out and hopefully not become ill, but the nature of that also exists during a catastrophic event. And so, you know, hopefully we've got some people at the campus and we're working through cleanup and, and we're ensuring the work continues to the perspective of the adjusters and claims managers and we say safely because it has to be done safely and so we're implementing safety meetings and consistently communicating proper ppe during remediation and renovations yeah i just think about you know rubberized boots in a in a flood condition um forever for all of my life, I've worn boots in a flood condition. Rooms and equipment are uncovered and exposed for cleaning. New electrical hazards are revealed. I, I, you know, floods, it's just one thing about floods. When you have a you have a flood and then after you have a flood, you have a fire, it's disastrous. And so you're going to get into an, an area where it's going to be really very hazardous. And so you got to make sure your teams are dressed out properly. That's, that's huge. Many materials are contaminated and hazardous during the initial start cleanup. So as you're moving stuff about, you have gloves, um, all kinds of covers, coveralls, overalls, anything to protect the body. Um, definitely from electrical. Potential safety hazards, incidents, they can be reduced, you know, just noting and watching for daily PPE PPE wear. So that, that's a daily process. Everybody's got to watch everybody in safety condition. And so, I, you know, when I look at this picture, I'm going, you know, 
exploit prior experiences and proficient processes. You know, the nature of this picture is showing that things are being rebuilt up the side of the bayou, and that's exactly what we do as a species all over the planet is we're going to adapt. You know, community resilience to remedy a problem saves money over time. And so we're, we're continuously thinking about the flooding event. There's plans to, to, to redo flooding paths and causeways. And, you know, you, you always come up with solutions after a catastrophic event. And it takes years to implement those solutions, along with the, um, uh, the funding that goes behind them. But the nature of the human species is we are resilient. You know, over time, we we learn the the ability to anticipate, cope with, and respond to cat catastrophic changes, which is exactly what this presentation is about. You know, just some fundamentals to stay concentrated on. We're always exposed to repetitious climate events in coastal locations with hurricanes. We just are. Um, we are adapting to these events with proficient solutions and processes. An example of the picture, as I watched supporting counties, government, corps of engineers work these causeways and continue to build and correct, yet it never stops. I've seen it my entire life in use in 60 years. We're always rebuilding. We're always trying to build better. And the nature of that is, um, you know, are there... Are there securities that are out there in the future, like a resilience bond? Is there some type of security bond that, uh, that is a security investment um, that we could use in the future? Um, it's an interesting prospect. And so some of, this, some of these links here is adaption of our species. I thought this was an interesting link because it just helps to exploit experiences, the vulnerability and the impact scenarios. And this is all over the world, uh, climate change, impact scenarios. Also, how we respond by adaptability in groups. This is a very interesting read in my opinion because it's going to be it's going to be about planning um, for tools and all kinds of different catastrophes. And I want to look at this content, just time scales, decision makings. This is continuously, it's continuously reviewed after catastrophic events and, and the hardship of, of communities. It's, it, there's continuous information being put out. So I, I hope I've just fundamentally placed some pieces in front of you that, that help. And if you have any questions, by all means. Billy? Yes, we have questions coming in. And I will bring them up here in just a second. OK. OK. Our first question was, was all of this water tidal storm surge or rain runoff flooding? Yeah, both. I, you know, the, the, the storm was so large, if you think about it in the first picture, um, you've got water coming from north of the city, plus a surge at the coast, and all that water is coming down to one area. It's eventually going to make it to the coast. So it's coming through those bayous and just, yeah, you know, it's like the storm surge fills you up for 30 miles and then all the water that's dropped from the storm comes back down to the coast and just runs through the entire community. Um, that's why we were underwater for such a long time. We, it just took that long to get the water uh, moved back to the coast. That's Ultimately, that's where the water is going to, right back to the Gulf. Does that make sense? Our next question is, what did you do with your service vehicle? Um, we moved them to a higher level that was just north. Believe it or not, that was such a high level 
um, that they did not get flooded or possibly one got flooded. Okay, thank you. Next question, finding information is very important part of this presentation. Did you partner with your librarians to find the best information for your needs? Actually, we have a library on uh, on on campus. That's that's really a no brainer. They got a lot of information up there, a lot of books. Um, partnering with a librarian is smart <laughs> because you can get a lot of stuff online. But if you go up there, there's all kinds of data that you can read. Thank you. Is the building equipment around your campus elevated? Will FEMA pay or mitigation to elevate things like that? Well, that's a change in design. And so, you know, you got to, yeah, I, I have to put myself in the position of the in, in insurance provider. Um, that would be my expense. You know, at no point in time can I redesign. Um, that's going to, I'm, I'm going to have to pick that expense up myself. Um, in the original design, was that considered? Was that a decision in the original design? Um, well, you, you, it's very possible you may not be the owner of that, the original owner of that building and built that building. But, you know, if you're the purchaser of a building, then all those things have to be considered. And I, I would say that uh, you got to, you got to rebuild what is originally there. If you're going to redesign it, you're going to pay for it. And it may require that. It may require that you redesign some things. Um, just depends on how old the property is. Okay, thank you. Do existing flood maps reflect the risk you have experienced in Houston? Could you repeat that question, please? Did existing do existing flood maps reflect the risk you have experienced in Houston? Yes, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to say that that if you look at a ten-year-old flood map that it's going to be the same because there's construction, civil construction, all over the place. I mean, we you know I, I've seen roads being. Um, rebuilt since I was able to drive, since I got a license, the same highways. Um, so there's constant civil work. And so, you know, those are updated. And unfortunately, what updates those is a, a new flood. All of a sudden, now we've got a new footprint for where water lays. You know, I hate to say that, but that's, that's the honest to God truth. So, you know, it pays to go out there and, and uh, look up flood plans and try to understand what's changed within a three to five year period. Really important because different decisions are made. And so those plans will change. Okay, thank you. How did the communication go between How did the communication go between facilities, VP business, and the president? Um, I thought it went well, in my perception, because if you're communicating and you're getting those messages down from the executive team, um, through the claims managers, down to the people that are actually doing the work, um, I thought that communication went very well. And keep in mind, I've been through a few storms Ike, I worked for four years, actually. And so, and that was, a, I wasn't in a public institution. Um, I was in a private, in a private building, in private skyscrapers. So that was a totally different language there. So I thought we did exceptionally well. In fact, you know, one of the things that came down from our executive team is, can we get the gym open? There's people in need. Can we do this? Can you collaborate this? And, and uh, we said, absolutely, we can. And that was a really good decision, in my opinion. That was an excellent decision because we're right there moving towards that building anyway. So and that was a community need. I mean, you know, you got to think about those pieces. Okay. Did drone technology assist in the documentation of damages? 
some of it did yes um less than probably you know because simply because you know, drone technology you know we're not going to use we're probably not going to use a drone you know around the flooded areas of the building you know you're going to get an idea like like the picture you're seeing right now um you're going to get an idea of all of that area the full area but when you start getting close to the building fenestration in the building you're really be, going to be looking on the inside of the building for damages relative to fenestration um there was some pictures that there are pictures that are that show some decks and and uh roofs and but for the most part nobody during the during the catastrophe was flying drones so afterwards yes there's a tremendous amount of documentation for the entire area thanks to drones i mean just the magnitude of the storm that was all provided by drones or most of it. We have time for a couple more questions here. How long was the campus closed? How long did it take to repower the campus? Was mold a concern when get concerned given weather conditions? Yes, mold is absolutely a concern. Yeah, all hazardous pieces. That's definitely well. None of that. We were moving into winter, <laughs> so here we were in in summer and. We're into the cleanup process. We have contractors and man claims managers and adjusters and all of us are, you know, within, I don't know, within, we had, we had the sent, we had one central plant back online within, um, uh, I think it was seven, eight days, uh, because people were available to access the university. Um, I, I think everybody has contractors that have worked with them for years and, and and if they, they were knowledgeable and they were around, they gave us a tremendous amount of help. And so we actually had to plan online that's seven to eight days afterwards because we needed refrigeration, we needed cooling. It's the only way we were going to deal with humidity. And uh, that was a lot of work. I mean, that was uh, transformers, motors. There were three or four contractors out here along with our staff, you know, working through the, to get the plant, the chiller plant back online. And then here again, like here comes here comes winter, so we got to get the boiler plant back online, and so that was underwater as well. So you, know, you just kind of move into the next next piece. Um, I want to say what uh, people were, were were coming out to the university within ten to fifteen days. It was amazing. It was it was amazing what was opened up. Hey, we have time for one more question here. And if we don't get to your question, it, uh, the questions will be forwarded to Chris and he will reach out to you with an answer. Our last question is, what was the biggest lesson learned in regards to your prior planning? What would you have done differently? Oh, um, that is a really good question. You know, that's a really good question. What would I have done differently? You know, that when you're when you're in a catastrophic event you always want to say what, what what would i have done differently but when it's catastrophic like this everything's underwater um i, I feel like we were yeah you know, our system was pretty doggone successful um yeah we were really successful i'm i'm not so sure i i would like to i, I would say one thing i would like to capture more of our recovery dollar can i say that um, I would like to capture more of our recovery dollar from FEMA insurability. I'll, I'll say that. Work on capturing more of that dollar. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more quick question. Question: Has your campus installed removable flood walls and or installed deep well pumps like other universities have done that have experienced floods? Uh, we are working on that point, actually. Um, we, we have some design for that because, um, you know, we've, we've, we've got a building that actually goes right out to back in the 1910s and 1920s that they used to bring product right up the bayou you're looking at and load it to the inside of the building. And so, and, and just, you know, 100 yards down from that, product was brought in, uh, 
a river up to a bayou and then brought into the city in the, in the 1900s. So, yeah, we're working on those pieces, floodgates. In, in fact, you know, that, that potential exists around Houston a lot. Um, floodgates, pumps, sump pumps. Um, you know, you, it, it has to be a reasonable, reasonable expense, you know. Um, you, you may, you know, some people think of it as like, yeah, I think of it as this, if I'm going to put something underneath the ground and I'm going to pay a fortune for it and then it's not going to work, you know, 10 years later, I, I question that expense. Even though I know I'm going to need something somewhere, it could be portable. It could be, uh, you know, I, I bought pumps on trailers where I could haul them off and then bring them back on and just have, you know, a hundred foot of line, section line and discharge line instead of installing something that's primarily intact. So, you know, what is your need? You got to really think about your need there. Okay, Chris, if you'll flip to your last slide, I want to bring everybody's attention to Chris's contact information. Please feel free to reach out to him and he will uh, get back to you. Again, I want to thank Chris for a very insightful informational webinar. I want to thank all of our attendees for taking time out of their busy schedules for um, attending today. And the webinar recording and presentation slides will be available on the Apple website early next week. So again, have a great afternoon, and thank you so much for attending. Bye-bye now. Thank you.